uh, it, it did a lot of work uh, on uh, computation. Yeah, if you do the usual thing, it would be nice. I am on the conference call, but uh, yeah, I, I see some uh, background noise. But um, um, is very famous uh, for his studies on uh, the dynamics of blood in a set of uh, communicating vessels. So if you're interested in this kind of studies, you should ask him and invite him to give a seminar. But it's basically a very general model of synaptic plasticity, and it can have a lot of applications for neuromorphic engineering. And in particular, we are working on some of these applications in the context of a DARPA project on a lifelong learning machines, because this might be one of the mechanisms for protecting against catastrophic forgetting. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this uh, uh, today, but you know, this was just an opportunity to introduce Marcus to you guys. And uh, what I'm going to do is really to talk about some uh, neural code. And what I would like to start with is with a few considerations about um, uh, neural representations. And I want to start with a very simple example. So, you know, this is uh, something you're probably familiar with. It's the MNIST uh, uh, data set. And um, so these are handwritten digits. Oh, actually, it should be a, a popular uh, benchmark um, in the machine learning community. It's, you know, oh, it's, in your yeah, it's probably good if you all mute uh, your microphone. And uh, please yes, stop yes, me anytime. Please. But uh, uh, for now, yeah, it would be better if you mute it. Okay, thanks. So um, basically here, um, I'm considering only four digits. And one of the things that uh, uh, you want to uh, consider when you look at the representations of these digits, so let's really focus on the images of these digits. Uh, the neural representation could take advantage of the similarities of all these different digits. So if you look at the proper features, then all these ones might be similar um, in uh, some space. And uh, typically, if you really want to classify them in the proper way, they should be similar so that you can generalize easily to some other ones that will be presented. Now, this is a very simple form of generalization. And what I would like to focus on today is something that is a little more cognitive, that uh, doesn't involve only sensory similarities. So for instance, you know, the, this would be another example, like you look at all these and what they share, but it would be more interesting to try to look at representations of a more abstract concept like parity. So whether a digit, and again, this, in this case would be really an image, is odd or even, okay? So this essentially would be two different groups and uh, they actually don't have any similarity. You can have ones and trees. They're actually uh, linked by something else, by something that you might learn in a different context and uh, I'm going to discuss later. Mm -hmm. But let's say that uh, you really want to represent uh, parity uh, of these images, which is a property that has nothing to do with the similarity of the, of the different images. Okay, so you know, I, it's important to stress that uh, the kind of abstract concept I'm considering here is not based on the mathematical properties of the digits. It's really just related to the way that some supervisor might instruct the neural system that we're going to consider uh, to put together. Okay, so now let's look inside uh, a neural network and let's see what kind of representations we might have of parity. And I, I will start uh, by introducing this, uh, the firing rate space. So here along each axis, I have the firing rate of uh, individual neurons. So F1 would be the firing rate of neuron one, F2 neuron two, F3 neuron three. And of course, in general, you're going to consider thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons. So you're gonna have a, a very high dimensional space that I cannot represent. But you know, this is just to visualize things and only considering three neurons. Okay, so now for every instance of these images, you can imagine that you present the image to the neural system as an input, and then you look at the neural representation. So the neural representation here would be 
the three values of the firing rates of these three neurons, and there would be a point in this firing rate space. So this would be, for instance, the firing rate activity that you record when you present a one. And analogously, you can do the same for two, three, and four. These are four samples from these different classes. Okay, so I'm starting here from a very specific type of representation. I'm assuming that for every class, the firing rate vector is a random vector. So you see that the points are at random locations and they typically define this tetrahedron. Anyway, they define an object that has the maximal dimensionality for this number of points. So in this particular case, they define a 3D object and uh, this is the maximal dimensionality that you can have with four points and uh, in this very simple case. Now here I'm coloring the points according to parity. So you see the uh, points that are in red are the odd, correspond to the odd classes, and the points that are in blue correspond to the even classes. And given that the representations are random, one of the nice properties of these representations is that you can actually separate the points in any way you like. And in particular, you can separate the two points corresponding to these even samples, the two and four, from one and three, even using a very simple uh, linear classifier. So a linear classifier in this space would be a, essentially an hyperplane, in this case a plane, that separates the point that would activate the output unit from the points that would inactivate the output unit. So I'm drawing here a, a, a plane, this yellow plane that is separating points two, four from points one. Okay, so this means that you can certainly decode parity and you can probably also have some form of generalization. So, you know, if you have good representations and all the fours are around here, all the twos around here, and again here, all the ones are around this point, all the threes around this point. Then if you use some held out samples from your data set, this will probably generalize correctly. Okay, so this is not a bad representation. However, you should consider that for this representation, the points are really a random locations. And you can separate the points in any way you like. So parity doesn't have anything special. It's just one dichotomy, one way of dividing the points into two groups. So for instance, you can introduce here a different concept, which is magnitude. In this simple case with only four points, you just have small that will correspond to another grouping that is a group of one and two, and large, which is three and four. Okay? And uh, I don't know if it's clear, this is not a great picture, but uh, you know, if you can imagine this tetrahedron in uh, uh, really a 3D representation, uh, then uh, you can uh, separate the one, two points from the three and four. This is actually true for any grouping that you want to consider. And different groupings or different dichotomies, different ways of dividing the points into two equal groups um, would correspond to different variables. So for instance, one, three, versus two, four would be parity, one, two versus three, four would be magnitude. Other ways of dividing the points don't really have a name, but they would correspond to other points. Okay, so now this is uh, um, one way to characterize these geometries and to essentially say that they have this interesting property that you can separate the points in any way you like is by introducing the average um, decoding performance of a linear classifier when you consider all possible dichotomies. So not only this, but all of them. There are not that many with four points, but let's say that you consider all of them. You train a decoder on, uh, um, on some samples from let's say one, three, and two, four, and then you test it on the held out samples from the same classes, one, three, and two, four. And you test whether you can actually divide the points in this way that would correspond to the variable parity. Then you do it for magnitude and you do it for all the other ways, okay? So, you know, essentially every dichotomy corresponds to one way of shattering this 3D object uh, 
and uh, dividing the points into two groups. And if you can separate them with a linear classifier, then you're successful and th that counts as a, uh, um, a dichotomy that can be decoded. So what you can compute is the average decoding performance across all these different dichotomies. And that's what I'm going to define as the shattering dimensionality. So this is something that uh, uh, we introduced um, in a, you know, a relatively old paper in 2013. And uh, we measured this shattering dimensionality or actually a quantity that is very similar to this shattering dimensionality in prefrontal cortex of monkeys. And we saw not only that the shattering dimensionality was maximal, but it, it was also correlated to behavior. So every time the monkey, um, we observed, um, let's say a drop in the dimensionality, we could predict that the monkey was going to make a mistake. So not only the dimensionality was high, this shattering dimensionality was basically maximal, but it seemed to be important to perform the task. Okay, it's not too surprising. If you want a linear readout that it's simple, that you need this uh, high dimensionality and uh, high shattering dimensionality would reflect essentially this kind of geometry. Okay, so please stop me anytime, especially on this conceptual part, and um, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay. So now th there is really nothing special here about parity. The points are at random locations. So if we want to introduce something that resembles what we could call an abstract representation, we need to require a little more. We cannot just require that the information is there as in this case. And it's not sufficient also that we can decode that variable. The fact that the variable is decodable doesn't say much in terms of abstraction. We need to do something more than that. Okay, so, you know, here, what I'm trying to do is to identify the features of the geometry that could be uh, used as a defining characteristic of abstraction. So the first step that I'm going to do is to consider one simple form of abstraction. Um, they found that healthy. Sorry, was there a question? I couldn't uh, hear. Okay. The question? No, I think we're just in interference. Okay. All right. So then, uh, if you look at the definition of uh, abstract on the Merriam Webster, um, there are several definitions, but the first one, and probably the most relevant for us, is disassociated from any specific instance, okay? So basically, this is saying, if you can build some kind of invariant representation that encodes only the variable that you care about, let's say parity, then of course, you would call this an abstract representation that would be independent uh, from all the details, uh, the high dimensional details of the specific instances. So in terms of geometry, one possible way of doing it, and this is something that uh, Matthew Botvinnik uh, proposed uh, at uh, DeepMind, is the following, that uh, essentially you're clustering the points that correspond to one value of, of your variable and uh, the points that correspond to the other value of your variable. Here we're considering only binary variables. So in this particular case, you're gonna have two points here, two and four that correspond to uh, even numbers and two points that correspond to odd numbers. But basically you discarded all the details about the specific instances. Here, the difference between two and four and the difference between one and three is only due to noise. They basically have the same representation. Okay. Now, in this case, of course, you can decode parity, but you can do also much more than that. And uh, the, I will get there in a second, but the first thing that you should consider is that uh, certainly you can do more and I'll show you that. But on the other hand, you can do it only for one variable. There is no information at all about other variables. And this is reflected by the shattering dimensionality, which is much lower than its maximum value. And it's actually very close to, to chance level. Okay, on the other hand, you have a much stronger form of generalization that is allowed by this kind of representations. Uh, 
So for instance, let's say that you train your decoder on a subset of digits. So in this particular case, there are not many choices because we have only four, but let's say that you train your decoder on one and two, on the small numbers. And you train it to report the parity, so whether the number, the digit is odd or even. Okay, now you train your decoder on these two and you get an hyperplane as usual. But now instead of testing this decoder on some left out uh, digits um, that belong to all possible classes, now you focus on the other classes, so three and four. And in this particular case, thanks to the arrangement of the points, you will actually be able to generalize right away. Okay? So, you know, essentially for this decoder, for the pink decoder, these three and four are completely novel situations. Okay? And actually, they have no similarity at all to one and two. But because of this abstraction process that led to these representations, then whatever you learn about one and two, you know, it could be a new motor response or it could be a new way of classifying these digits, then it will generalize to three and four according to this uh, uh, parity uh, concept that we incorporated in this representation. Okay, okay so this is such an important uh, property that we want to use it as a defining characteristic of abstraction. And we called it uh, cross-condition generalization because you know, instead of the digits, pretty soon I'm going to switch to the real experiments where we have different conditions, different experimental conditions, visual stimuli and so on. Okay, so now um, I want to stress that uh, if you take these random representations that I discussed at the beginning, so they allow you to decode any variable that you like, but they don't have a, a cross-condition generalization that goes beyond chance. So for instance, if you now play the same game, you train on one and two, and you test on three and four, you see you get this pink hyperplane, and uh, you, um, there is really no reason why three and four should be on the right side of this hyperplane, because they are a random location. So there is nothing linking together one and three that are actually uh, odd numbers and two and four that are even. Okay, so now um, this is just to stress that uh, the classical way of decoding variables has nothing to do with this cross-condition generalization or more precisely, it, it doesn't have, uh, um, it, it's not, it's, it's going to be correlated, but it's not the same quantity. And you can have situations in which the decoding accuracy is pretty high, but the cross-condition generalization is, is close to chance, as in this particular case. Okay, so now just to summarize, so we use two quantities to characterize the geometry of, of these representations, the shattering dimensionality and cross-condition generalization performance. And here we focused on one particular dichotomy, which is parity. So for these high dimensional representations, the points are at random locations, but any high dimensional representation would have the same property. You have a maximal shattering dimensionality, but the cross condition generalization performance is close to chance. And in this other case, this is an extreme form of abstraction where you discarded all the information about the irrelevant variables. So you focus only on parity then the shattering dimensionality is very low and the cross-condition generalization uh, is actually very high. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce other two geometries. And what I would like to do is to find something intermediate that is gonna be a sort of a compromise that would enable you to uh, encode multiple variables in an abstract format with this cross-condition generalization performance. Uh, above chance. And eventually what I would like to do is that not only you have this stricter form of generalization, but that you can actually decode also all possible dichotomies. Okay, so the first step is the following. 
So let's say that now I want to build representations that encode multiple abstract variables, and they are abstract according to our definition, so they cross-generalize. Uh, so one simple way is to take advantage of the fact that your space is actually very high dimensional. You have hundreds of thousands of neurons. So what you could do is to use some neurons to encode one variable and some other neurons to encode a different variable. So you could have parity along this axis and magnitude along this other axis. And the kind of representations you would get in this very simple example with only four points is basically a square that is intermediate between the 1D extreme case proposed by Botvinnik, where you have clustering, and the case in which you have the maximal dimensionality, the 3D case of the tetrahedron. Okay, so now these representations are interesting because they cross-generalize. So for instance, you can train a decoder on one and two to decode parity. You get this hyperplane and that would generalize right away to three and four, but you can also do it for a second variable, which is magnitude. So that corresponds to a different dichotomy or a different way of uh, grouping the, 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 the different um, uh, digits. So you can have, a, you can train a decoder now to decode magnitude on one and three, and then you test it on two and four. So again, two and four are a kind of a novel situation for this decoder that uh, is trained on to report whether a digit is large or small, and it would generalize right away. Okay, so now I, with this kind of representations, I can have a number of abstract variables that in principle can be as large as the number of uh, neurons that I have in, in my system. I'm saying in principle, because then you have to consider noise and many other factors, but uh, in principle, that's something that would be possible. So this is something that is studied a lot in the machine learning community. These representations are called factorized. You know, this uh, magnitude and parity will be two different factors or disentangled. And in particular, the, there is um, a lot of work that Irina Higgins, a deep mind has done in the um, recent years to study uh, beta variational autoencoders. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what they are, but they're essentially autoencoders that uh, generate very interesting representations where they identify automatically some factors and um, these uh, factors are represented along orthogonal directions. So, you know, this is a nice example of um, a beta variational autoencoder. To be honest, also standard variational autoencoders uh, have a very similar property. Uh, a beta variational autoencoder is just an autoencoder that has a beta factor in front of, uh, of the term in the loss function that encourages the network to find solutions that are factorized. Um, so they're a little more factorized than in the case of the variational autoencoders. But yeah, any kind of uh, uh, good autoencoder has a similar property. And you can see here that uh, by showing uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, images of chairs, the system, the autoencoder can actually find uh, factors that have a simple interpretation for us. So for instance, the first one is the azimuth. You can see that, uh, for instance, you can present this chair as an input, as a visual input, and then you just change the value of one particular neuron that is encoding the azimuth, and you get the rotated version of the chair. Okay, all these are rotated versions of the chair. Analogously with the width and, uh, for instance, leg style, when you change uh, these are the neuron you go from uh, this style to this other style of the chair. Okay? So basically, you know, what you would have in these geometries, for instance, you could have that this neuron is encoding the azimuth, this one, the leg style, and now you can train uh, a decoder to decode leg style for these two chairs, and that would generalize right away to all the chairs that are oriented in many other different ways. Okay? So for instance, you can have a particular output uh, for one uh, particular leg style, and then you train your system on uh, only uh, very few chairs, and that would generalize automatically to all the chairs that have a different azimuth or maybe different width and so on. Okay, so you know, these are interesting representations. And um, you know, let me go back to this uh, simple example of parity and magnitude. Um, 
the only problem is that uh, we don't see these representations in the brain. Okay, you never have these highly specialized neurons that encode only one factor. However, what you could do is to take these representations and rotate them in your original high dimensional space. So for instance, you get something like this. Okay? So now each individual neuron is encoding multiple variables, in this case, magnitude and parity, but you preserve all the generalization property properties of the original uh, representation, and in particular, the cross-condition generalization. You can train on one and two, and then uh, this will generalize automatically to three and four. It's a linear transformation, so it's not surprising that uh, a linear decoder will still have the same properties. Okay. okay, you know, so this could be the representations that we observe in the actual brain. But there is one last step that I want to make. So there is one problem. If you really take seriously this kind of representations and you have a perfectly factorized representation, then it's going to be a relatively low dimensional representation. Okay? It's not as low dimensional as the extreme clustering geometry that I showed you, but still there are dichotomies that then you will not be able to separate with a linear decoder. So for instance, let's say you want to separate mid range digits from extreme values. Okay, so in this case would be, would mean to group together two and three and one and four. Okay? So this is something you cannot do because now the four points are at the vertices of a square, which is a 2D structure. And uh, this problem is uh, equivalent to the classical exclusive or problem. So it's non-linearly separable. However, there is something you can do. So, okay, first of all, let me summarize that uh, basically, you know, this is the, um, this kind of disentangled factorized representation. The shattering dimensionality is not maximal. It's not so bad in this case, but actually it would go down to chance level exponentially fast when you increase the number of points. So it, it is actually bad. And uh, it's only in this very peculiar example that it's not so bad, but still it's not maximal. And uh, the cross-condition generalization performance in this case is very close to maximal for two variables simultaneously. Okay, so there's one thing you can do. You start from this um, relatively low dimensional representation, and now you introduce this kind of perturbations. Okay, so you move the points a little away from the vertices of the square. So you essentially now start to go into the third dimension in this particular case. Of course, you know, what you should imagine is actually the case where you have a very high dimensional space. Okay, so if you do that, you can actually find a surprisingly good compromise where you have still the ability to cross generalize as shown here, but at the same time, you will also be able to separate the points in any way you like. This is summarized here. So you see here that you have on the x-axis is the amplitude of this um, displacement of the perturbation. And uh, on the y-axis, I have the cross-condition generalization performance. And you see that uh, when the displacement is zero, you have basically the square, the original square, the 2D structure. So CCGP is maximal, and then it goes down. Now, in the case of the shattering dimensionality, you have to, um, there is clearly always a trade-off between these two quantities. So as soon as you increase the displacement magnitude, you see that the shattering dimensionality goes up and then in the end it saturates at one. However, there is this region here where you have a pretty good compromise, okay? So none of them can be really maximal, but they're both really high, very close to one. Okay, so these are actually simulations that Marcus performed. Okay, so now, you know, of course, this depends on a number of assumptions. And uh, what I would like to do now is to look at the real data. Uh, but, you know, before that, I want to summarize these four geometries. And essentially, what I'm going to show you is that this nice compromise that you can find in the simulations where you have maximal shattering dimensionality and also 
a few variables that are in an abstract format in the sense that they cross generalize is what we see in the experiments. Okay, so given that I'm not there in person, I'll stop a second. If you have any questions about this conceptual part, please let me know. Okay, so I assume that you understood everything. And um, let me now show you what happens in the real data. Okay, so now first I'm going to describe the experiment uh, um, that uh, they did in uh, Salzman's lab. But, you know, I can certainly mention that we analyzed several other data sets and we see something very similar to what I'm going to show you. And again, ask Marcus if you want to know about all the details because he's involved in every aspect of this project. Okay, so monkeys were trained to do the following. So they would start a trial by holding a bar then a fractal, an image, would be shown on the screen, so it's a meaningless stimulus for them. And they had to learn that in response to this particular fractal, they had to release the bar. If they do so, they get a reward. And there were four possible images, and for each image, they had to learn a different uh, motor association. So in response to A, they had to release and also to C. And uh, to B and D, they, they had to keep holding the bar. In case of A and B, if they did the right thing, they would get a reward. And in the case of C and D, they would not get anything, but they would avoid the punishment, which was a timeout. And they really hated to the point that they were really motivated to do it correctly also for C and D. Okay, okay so now this is something relatively simple that monkeys can learn very quickly. However, the interesting part was when they started to change the rules and uh, using the same stimuli, now they would change the visual motor associations. Okay, so for instance, for A, now the monkey has to hold the bar in order to get a reward or in this particular case to avoid the punishment. So basically there are two of what are called task sets or two contexts and um, uh, they kept switching between these two contexts in a totally unpredictable way. Okay? So the monkey had to figure out by trial and error whether to use one task set or the other task set. Okay, so in this particular case, um, and this is an interesting situation where you can actually create this abstract variable in a way that is probably very general, uh, what defines the context is nothing related to the properties of the specific instances that are defined by the these triplets, the stimulus, the motor response, and uh, and um, the the reward. What defines the context is really in the temporal structure of the task. It's in the fact that uh, these types of trials follow each other much more often than these other types of trial. Okay? But if you look at the single triplet, there's nothing in there that would tell uh, the monkey whether you're in context one or in context two. Okay, so then this requires some process of abstraction if you really want to have a, a, you know, a representation of context. And um, what I'm going to show you is that actually they create this abstract representation of context. Okay, so first of all, there is something in the behavior that is interesting. So they're not relearning for sure every time we switch from one context to another because they can do some simple form of inference. So let's say you start from context two, you present A as the last uh, trial in context two. Monkey is still holding a bar and then in this case it avoids a punishment. Now we switch to context one the monkey doesn't know that and it cannot know it because there is no contextual cue. So the very first time you present B, then the monkey has to um, uh, release the bar and it's going to make a mistake because it doesn't know that uh, we changed the rules. However, the very first time now you present a different stimulus, the monkey can infer that uh, we switch to a different context so the monkey has to respond in a according to the new context, and the monkey does that, okay? So typically it takes a couple of trials, not just one, but then they can certainly do inference on uh, trial types that they've never seen in the new context. So they're not relearning. 
Okay, so the first thing um, we did was to see whether there was any information at all in about context. And, you know, this is also to tell you that uh, they recorded from five different brain areas, hippocampus, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ACC, and also from OFC and from the amygdala, but we are still analyzing the data for these two last uh, um, areas. Okay, so now you see here, this is the decoding accuracy. It's a linear decoder. Of course, it's cross-validated performance uh, as a function of time during a typical trial. So it starts from minus one and time zero you, it's when you present the stimulus. And you see that even in the interval preceding the stimulus, you can decode context with very high accuracy. It's slightly lower in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but only because we have uh, less neurons. If you actually equalize the number of neurons, it's very strong in all the three areas. And anyway, you know, this is really uh, a variable that is very strongly encoded. Uh, uh, typically from these animals, it's not so easy to get very close to 90%. Okay, so the information about context is there, but as I showed you earlier, there are so many ways of encoding context and we want to know whether context is encoded in this special way, in this uh, abstract format. Okay, so before going to the analysis of the shattering dimensionality and the cost condition generalization performance, let me show you the representation so you get an idea what they look like. So we used multidimensional scaling to reduce the dimensionality of the representation to project from hundreds of dimensions to only three. And uh, so you shouldn't take these representations too seriously, it's just for visualization purposes, but they're anyway instructive. So you see here, I have four points corresponding to four conditions in context one, which is red, and four points corresponding to context two, which is in blue. A, B, C, and D are the stimuli that have been presented. And then H and R is hold or release, it's what the monkey did. <coughs> and then plus and minus is whether then the monkey got a reward or it avoided the punishment. And um, you see, I wanted to highlight the points in which a monkey got a reward, and these are in uh, yellow. Okay, so you see some clustering. And, you know, initially when we saw this, we said, okay, let's try to do the Botmanic uh, analysis. Let's see whether there is any significant clustering. And there is. So it would actually pass the test of uh, Matthew Botmanic. And they actually found something very similar in their studies in um, using fMRI. Now, you see a lot more than that, okay? This is in the hippocampus. So it's uh, very similar to what they saw in the fMRI. But you see a lot more than that. So if I rotate it, you see that first of all, the distances within each cluster are actually relatively large. So for instance, the points, uh, uh, the yellow points are very well separated from the other ones. And they're also very nicely arranged all on one side. And you also see this other nice property that basically you have two low dimensional manifolds, almost two planes that are kind of parallel. Okay? So this is again a signature of these factorized representations. Okay, so now let me show you what happens in, uh, in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is interesting because if you now do the clustering analysis for context, you would not pass the test of botanic. So you would conclude that uh, context is not represented in an abstract format if you do that. Okay, so now you can see that uh, uh, actually there is also some very interesting structure here. Okay, so when you rotate it, it's even more clear. And you see that these two parallel planes and also this nice arrangement of the points. And uh, it's very similar also in ACC. Actually here, you almost see the cube. That would be really the kind of representation you get for this factorized representation. So probably what we are seeing here is a representation that is encoding in an abstract format, not only context, but also some other variables. So in order to do that, we did the analysis. And in particular, we computed the cross condition generalization performance. And we did it not only for context, but actually for all possible variables that correspond to the 35 different dichotomies or different ways of grouping together the different conditions. 
Okay, so for instance, one way of grouping the conditions is this, that corresponds to context one and context two. But you could do it in this way. You're grouping here all the conditions that correspond to trials in which the monkey received the reward. Okay, so this is essentially encoding uh, another variable that is value. Or you could do it in this other way. So this is a crazy way of doing it, but who knows? I mean, we want to do it in a totally unbiased way and identify which variables are in this abstract format, okay? So, you know, this other dichotomy doesn't really have a name, but we tried all of them. Okay, so now we focus first on uh, this interval here. This is the interval preceding the presentation of the stimulus. So it's the interval between two um, trials. And uh, what we are focusing here is the encoding of context and what happened in the previous trial, because you know the monkey cannot predict what's gonna happen in the next trial, the stimuli are always random. So we focus on what happened essentially here, uh, in the interval preceding the interval that we are analyzing. So all the variables I'm going to consider now they refer to what happened in the previous trial. Okay, so now let me put the analysis for all the 35 dichotomies and then I will explain what these points uh, correspond to. So this is in the three areas, hippocampus, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and ACC. And the empty circles uh, are the decoding accuracy for all the 35 different dichotomies. And the field ones are for the cross-condition generalization performance. Now, you see, first of all, that the decoding accuracy is pretty high. It's significant for most of the dichotomies, even in this interval where the firing rates are relatively low. So it's around 0 0.7, 0 0.75, 0 0.74. Okay, so it's relatively high for uh, all the three brain areas. Okay, so this would normally indicate a high dimensional representation. However, you also see that uh, the cross-condition generalization performance for some of the variables is pretty high. In particular, let's focus on context. So context is the one circled in red, you know, for all these different cases. And it's almost close to one in the hippocampus. It's very strong, but it's also strong in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and in ACC, and it's certainly highly significant. Now, for you know, this number of, of uh, conditions, you cannot have really more than three variables that are in abstract format. But here you have uh, certainly other two interesting variables that are in an abstract format. One is value. So value is decodable as it's also not in an abstract format. And the third one is action in uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and in ACC. We don't understand why, but it's not in the, in the hippocampus, okay? So it's decodable, it's not that strong, but it's not in an abstract format. I'll show you a more convincing case in a second of this uh, you know, discrepancy between the two quantities. Okay, so now let's move to a, a different time interval when uh, actually the monkey already made the decision about the expectation of reward and the action to perform. So this is during the presentation of the stimulus. And you see here that this is the decoding accuracy for value, so the expected value. Um, and you see these three brain areas, and it goes up very rapidly as soon as the information about the stimulus is available. Basically, you know, just 100 milliseconds later, it goes up. It's a little later in the hippocampus. And this is for action. So we are going to focus on the time interval where all these two quantities, value and action, are actually decodable. Okay? So we move from here to there. And in this interval, you see that the geometry changes. And you see that, again, context is abstract in all the three brain areas. Uh, sorry, it's certainly decodable in all the three brain areas very strongly. It's around 0.9. Again, it's cross-validated, so it's not trivial in real data. But it, it's in an abstract format only in the hippocampus, and uh, you know it's slightly above chance in um, in the ACC. Um, you see that value and action they're abstract. Uh, in an abstract format and decodable in all the three brain areas. 
But the, one of the interesting thing is that context is not, is certainly not in an abstract format in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So what probably happens is that when the monkey has to make a decision, temporarily, at least in one brain area, it really needs to go into this high dimensional representation, truly high dimensional, not only for the shattering dimensionality, in order to be able to perform the task uh, correctly. And that's probably why, I mean, these are all speculations. We don't have any proof of that. Um, in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, it goes down. So, you know, we believe that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is probably the brain area where everything is happening. These are overtrained monkeys, so it's not too surprising. Okay, the shattering dimensionality is really high here. It's at around 0 0.9 in all the three brain areas. So again, it's a signature of this other form of high dimensionality. Okay, so, you know, the last part, and I'll cover it very quickly, is about simulations. So, you know, initially, I just constructed by hand the different representations. Now, I want to get them in a simulated network. And there are many ways of doing that. So, you know, we were really tempted initially to use a variational autoencoder, um, and it, it's certainly something that we intend to do. But then we just played the simplest game. We just used vanilla backpropagation in a very simple network. And we wanted to see what kind of geometry you get when you analyze it using uh, uh, our new techniques. Okay, so essentially I'm going to consider uh, a really shallow deep network. I mean, it's not really a deep network, it has only two layers. In, uh, in the problem that I uh, explained at the beginning. So let's say now we have all eight digits um, I'm not considering 10 because I want to have the same number of conditions as in the experiment. And I'm going to train a, a network to report whether a digit is odd or even. Okay? So it's one particular dichotomy. I have input layer and then the two intermediate layers and then two output units, one for even and one for odd. Okay, okay so now since I want, I'm interested in a situation in which uh, hopefully, I'm going to see multiple variables in an abstract format. I'm going to train the network also on a different concept simultaneously, which is magnitude. So I have other two units here that correspond to magnitude. And then I'm going to analyze the geometry in the second layer. Okay, so these are the MDS plots. And you see very nicely that these four clusters at the vertices of a square. Okay? This is not too surprising. Well, so then you're going to have that along one direction, you're encoding parity, and along the orthogonal direction, you're going to have the second factor in this case, which is magnitude. Okay? So this emerges naturally from a very simple um, uh, training procedure based on the uh, traditional uh, backpropagation. Okay, so now if you do our analysis, and you know this is really to illustrate the usefulness of the analysis, you try to decode the variables, and you consider, again, all possible 35 dichotomies. Also in this case, we have eight conditions, so you have 35 balanced dichotomies. The decoding accuracy is really high for all of them, exactly the same as in the data, okay? So this is great. It's 0 0.96, so it's pretty high. But this is also telling you that if you just stop there and all you do is just to decode a variable, you're not going to learn much about what the network is doing and what the network has actually learned in terms of concepts. You need to go beyond and really look at the geometry, other aspects of the geometry of the representation. So here, if you do the cross-condition generalization and you do it in a totally unbiased way, so you know the analysis here that Marcus did, was done in a completely blind way. He didn't know what the network was doing. It didn't have the behavior. And it didn't know what I used for training, uh, what concepts I used for training in uh, my simulations. I did the simulations and then I passed them to Marcus. So then he did the cross-condition generalization uh, performance analysis. And you see there are only really two points that are very well separated from the other. So the first one corresponds to parity and the second one corresponds to magnitude. Okay, so the interesting thing is that here, again, we don't know anything about the behavior. So in principle, this is a very powerful method for investigating uh, 
what an animal might have learned in terms of concepts and uh, how the animal might generalize to an exponential number of novel situations. Uh, this is one of the things that we are testing in the experiments. Okay, so you know, you might say this is really a trivial case. You actually have the concepts in the output in a very explicit format. But what happens, for instance, if you do something more sophisticated, like what we did in the, in the experiment? And so we did these simulations that essentially are very similar to what we did in the experiment. Uh, this is in a, actually in a supervised way, so it's not exactly the same. Here we have the input and it's just a feed forward network. So we had to put the memory of the previous trial by hand in the input. But we have also a version of the recurrent, uh, of a recurrent network that uh, has a very similar behavior. So we have value of the previous trial, action of the previous trial, and stimulus of the previous trial and current stimulus. This is all passed to the network. And the network has to output whether to hold or release and whether to predict a reward or no reward. And then if you um, analyze the geometry in the last layer, again, you get a geometry that is very similar to what we observed in the experiment for most of the simulations. Because one of the things that uh, you know, uh, many studies tend to ignore is that there is a lot of variability uh, from run to run when you train these networks. So here we reported the statistics for all of them, but for, you see here that essentially, for most of the networks, and each point corresponds to a different network, you have a very high CCGP for all these three variables. Okay, so you know, you might say this is just supervised learning. What happens if you use um, uh, really reinforcement learning? That's the way monkeys have learned this task. So we took inspiration from this very popular approach, um, which is deep Q learning, and it was introduced at DeepMind to the first time to play the Atari games, but then to do many other things. And we trained the network to um, perform exactly the same task that the monkeys are performing. Okay, I don't have time to go over the details, but again, these are in the paper. Okay, so surprisingly, actually this didn't work. We didn't get the correct um, geometry. And we had to introduce an additional term that essentially was forcing the network to reconstruct the input. So this goes a bit in the direction of the variational autoencoders. Because if you do that, then you actually get the same geometry. But we needed to add this um, small piece here. And uh, you know, we really believe that the hippocampus might play a very important role in, the, in this um, uh, element that was missing. Okay, so this is just to show that you, you get, of course, here it's more difficult and there is more variability because it's a reinforcement learning, but also in this case, you get um, very similar geometry. Okay, so this is the last slide. These are the conclusions. So, you know, I really define context. Uh, uh, I define in general what, what uh, um, abstract variables uh, could be and what kind of geometry they might have. And we have seen that in the data, you have these multiple abstract variables in all areas. And at the same time, you have very high shattering dimensionality. Okay, so these are really two nice properties of the geometry of these representations. Now, one interesting consideration is that uh, if you don't use these techniques, and uh, let's say you focus only on clustering, then you would probably draw the wrong conclusion, and it's good somebody stressed it now, <laughs> that uh, ACC and, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex actually are not representing context in an abstract format, but they do. And uh, there is a lot of evidence that I didn't uh, have time to uh, give you that actually the hippocampus doesn't play any role in, um, in these overtrained monkeys. So, you know, you have to be careful. If, when you look at the geometry, you need to consider the right aspects of the geometry. You get very similar representations in these very simple networks. We were a little surprised, but uh, actually now we have so many examples where we get this kind of geometry that we are convinced that it's relatively easy to get them. And um, so, you know, it's good that uh, uh, we also found them in the brain. Okay, so I will stop here, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, thank you, it was very nice work. So yes, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask, and I'll try to coordinate uh, or raise your hand, and I will uh, pass the...
Well, hi, Stefano. This is Terry. Hi, Terry. I really, uh, really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. Um, ha have you done any recording during the learning process? It would be interesting to see how it forms. Yeah, no, it would be great. We are doing it now. So it, we are introducing new stimuli and new associations, and we are monitoring the learning process. But yeah, we still don't have the data, unfortunately. You know, they started the experiment uh, uh, when COVID arrived and uh, we had to interrupt it. But yeah, I totally agree. That would be fantastic to... Yeah, and, and there's a related type of task, which uh, goes way back, which is uh, set, which is, which is to say you, you train an animal to do to some discrimination by position mm -hmm. or feature. But, uh, but uh, on every, uh, th and then you change the objects. Yep. And uh, they don't have to retrain on the task and they very quickly pick up, you know, the, uh, and, and do the correct uh, a choice uh, for, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a way for f being able to uh, abstract what the task Absolutely. is, right, away from the actual objects. Yeah, there are many works on that uh, um, from um, initially from Keiji Tanaka's group. And uh, I know the version of Barry Richmond, which is really beautiful. And uh, it's really an elegant way of training monkeys. And it's very impressive. But I'm, I'm not sure they actually recorded during training. And uh, it would be really great to see how they create these representations. Yeah, very good. Yeah, please go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, please ask the question now. Um, hi, my name is uh, Ying Long, and thanks a lot for the great work. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the the presentation that you gave. So I have a question regarding the uh, simulation of the shallow deep neural networks that you showed before. So you said uh, you train different, uh, did you train different neural networks um, for learning the parity and the magnitude? separately or do you um no no they were um the, there was only one network and uh, it was trained on both oh so, it was so did you uh like so for the magnitude did you train on top of the network that has already been trained uh for the parity task or yeah so you're, you're totally right that's a very interesting exercise we started to do it only a couple of weeks ago and uh, it it looks like uh, in that case, it's much more difficult to get uh, the right geometry. And, uh, you know, this might be related to some form of catastrophic forgetting that is also happening here. Um, but um, we don't know, to be honest, and it's a very interesting direction. Yeah, I see. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, I have two questions. One is related to the history because what you what uh, I mean, as you said, when they have to, when when they have to understand what is the context, they are not cute. So therefore, they have to remember the previous trials and current trial and mistake in order to to perform the task. And how how the history is represented and and uh, like. Well, is there any difference between the history representation and other task variables? Yeah, so that's essentially what I focused on when I uh, explained what happens in the interval preceding the stimulus, because this is all about history. Okay, so this is uh, really related to the variables in the previous trial. Okay, so this is uh, when we did the analysis in the interval that is preceding the stimulus. So value and action are actually the value and action of the previous trial, okay? not of the current trial. Context is the same in the previous and the current trial because we, uh, in this analysis, we excluded all the trials around the switch and uh, we are doing now the analysis of that and it's extremely interesting. I can tell you that actually what we see is that in one monkey, Unfortunately, we see it very clearly in one monkey, not in the other one. But in one monkey, we see that after a switch, when you go from one context to another, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is really the first one that encodes the new context. It switches very rapidly. 
and uh, hippocampus lags behind by 10, 15 trials, which is an eternity. I mean, given that an entire block is 80 trials, it's really slow. And this gave us the impression that somehow dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is switching right away in one or two trials, whereas the hippocampus is relearning every time, just in case, you know, if the situation changes, then you need to learn somewhere in the brain. Very interesting. And my second question is, what, what if you have a correlated input, like two variables are correlated in, in their nature or the animal learns the correlation or something? Because in, in this case, in, in, in your experiment, you try to find conditions that everything is random, is abstract, so there is no correlation. But for instance, let's take magnitude and length and things that can be correlated as an input. Yeah, so it, yeah, it depends on what you mean by correlations. In a, in, we clearly have overlaps between the groupings for magnitude and, uh, and uh, for parity, but I, I think I see what you, what you mean. And uh, so in the case in which two variables are highly correlated, I don't really know what happens. And in that case, you probably need to encourage the network to create these independent factors in a way that is similar to what people do in variational autoencoders. And it would be really interesting to study also that case, but we haven't done it yet. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Mm. I see that. Can you hear me? I have one question relating to how you um, how you categorize groups. So um, every decoder you've got is based on a dichotomy of the underlying basis. Question is: Have you looked at non dichotomies? For example, something like groups composed of or groups groups comprising successor relationships. So reward setting a context where. The reward happens when B follows A and C follows B and then D follows C. For just as an example, where they're not, it's not strictly a dichotomy, but it is still a context that could be tested um, with perhaps not a, a simple, uh, simple decoder. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure I understood because uh, I, I hear you very badly, but um, let, let, me see, let me try to answer and then uh, uh, you, you can ask me again. Uh, so in the case that we considered, all the variables are binary because okay? there's not a single variable that is not binary. So they have only two values. And uh, if you look at all possible combinations of these different variables, then you have all possible dichotomies. So the dichotomies basically give you all possible variables. There is no other way that you can separate uh, the conditions in two equal size groups. Of course, you can do it in uh, imbalanced dichotomies. That would be something that we didn't consider until now. But for the balanced dichotomies, we consider all possible variables. Of course, there might be other variables, especially, for instance, if you have some continuous variable or multi-value variables. And in, in, in our case, for instance, the stimulus is a multi-value variable because we have four possible stimuli. And uh, our um, theoretical framework at the moment does not apply to these cases. So we are working on that. We want to go to multi-valued variables and to continuous variables. But for now, we can deal only with binary variables. Also because when you go to multi-valued variables or continuous variables, the number of possible dichotomies of variables that you have grows exponentially and it's really difficult to do the analysis. So we are working on that. We are trying to find a, a better way of characterizing the geometry, but um, we are not there yet. So one question in the chat was, how does the structure of the network, uh, say, be it recurrent or not, um, affect uh, CCGP and shattering dimensionality in the simulation? So it's probably because our case is uh, relatively simple. 
but the structure of the network doesn't affect much the distributions of the, the, the geometry of the representations. I mean, we didn't try all you can try, but uh, for instance, for the feed forward networks, we varied a lot, the number of neurons, number of layers. And unless you go to really extreme cases, like you know, two neurons uh, in the intermediate layer, where obviously, for instance, you cannot have a maximal shattering dimensionality because then the upper bound is set by the number of neurons, then you get very similar geometries to what we have observed. So it's pretty robust. Sorry? Nothing, it was just a glitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so then um, uh, it, it's pretty robust, but uh, again, it might be due to the simplicity of the task that we are considering. So now we are trying to scale up all these uh, examples to more complex problems, and uh, we will see if it's still the case. Okay, thank you. So we have time for uh, one last question. Is there anyone? No, okay, I'll, I'll ask the last question then. Um, how long does it take the monkeys to learn the task? Oh, a lot, a lot of time, about 18 months for, for the first time. I mean, the second monkey was easier because we knew how to do it, but for the first monkey, it took really long time. It's a relatively difficult task, and um, especially because there is an operant response, not only, you know, value expectation. Um, now, I think they can train the monkey uh, much faster, so probably three, four months would be sufficient. And the monkeys that are already trained, when we train them on a different uh, set of images, they're really fast. In a week, they learn it. Okay, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned um, something, which was that uh, these are overtrained animals. And it could be that, as you, as you suggested, that you need the hippocampus at the beginning, but maybe not yeah. after you've been trained. Is, is that something you believe? That's exactly what we have in mind. And yeah. uh, it's one of the things we are testing. And it's one of the reasons why they're recording from uh, the hippocampus now in these new experiments. And they're really focusing on the hippocampus because we believe it, there are a lot of important things happening there. It, it would be interesting to deactivate the hippocampus and, and, and test that. Yeah, that's another possibility. And um, yeah, maybe we should try to think about that. I just have one quick uh, question. Um, actually, two quick questions. One is uh, the number of uh, simultaneously recorded neurons that you had in each region. And uh, the second question is, what subregion of the hippocampus were you recording from? Yeah, so they used V probes. And um, they, I think in the best days, they get something like 70, 80 neurons that are simultaneously recorded. Um, when you consider all the, the three probes that they uh, put into the monkey brain. So they typically put the three probes in three different uh, brain areas and uh, they, you know, every session they look at different uh, subsets of brain areas out of these five that I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning. And um, what, what was the second question, sorry? We uh, the subregion of the hippocampus. Yeah, it's difficult to say. I'm not sure they actually know exactly where they are in the in the hippocampus. Um, I, I should ask them, but I remember we had a long discussion with somebody who asked, and uh, basically Daniel Salzman said, we don't know. Um, just one clarifying question. You said 70 to 80 on best days. Is that per region or uh, in total? So the in three total. of them. It's in total. Now, now they can do much better because they have the new V probes. But um, you know, th this data was recorded a couple of years ago. And, um, so basically, your decoder accuracy can be up to ninety per, uh, percent by recording, say, like twenty neurons, thirty neurons per region, like within each region. If you only have no. that many. So all, all the analysis that I presented today, we combined all the neurons for different sessions together, so they were not recorded simultaneously. I see. Uh, just a quick, quick question. Uh, probably you do not have many uh, errors in this case. Yeah. But what would be your expectation about the uh, relationship between the shattering dimension and the CCGP in error trials? So we actually did the analysis. And I, I didn't present it because we did it a couple of weeks ago. And so it's something relatively new. Um, so I can tell you what we observed. Um, 
essentially what happens, we focused on context in the interval preceding the stimulus. And what happens is that the cross-condition generalization performance for context decreases significantly in the error trials. And also the shattering dimensionality decreases um, significantly. Instead, the ability to decode only one variable, which is context, remains the same. So the information is there, but the geometry changes. Now, we don't know whether the um, cross-condition generalization performance or the shattering dimensionality is the important one because both are correlated with behavior. But what I would expect is that actually the important aspect of the geometry for performing the task is not in the interval that we analyze, that is the interval preceding the stimulus, but it's in the interval between the time we can decode the stimulus and the time the monkey actually makes a decision, which is the time interval in which the monkey has to mix non-linearly context and the stimulus identity. And the problem is that we have less than 100 milliseconds there. So we just cannot do the analysis with the neurons that we have now. Thank you. All right, so I think <clears throat> there is no more question. So thanks again, uh, Stefano, for uh, this. Well, nice. thanks a lot. No, this was really useful for me. And um, I'm glad that um, we can still do these things. Yeah, don't we? All right. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.